Okay. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I have to bring things back to layman's terms so that I can yes. sort of understand what's going yeah. on here. Uh, you, you published a paper, I think, a year or so ago called Function Forms from the Symmetry Between Order and Disorder. Exactly. from so. the American Physiological Society. So yes. you use the term symmetry, but in fact, as, as Ian has said, the, you know, the term is a coincidence of opposites, perhaps. Is it a, is a very strange symmetry, way of describing I agree, it. yes. But the point that you're making, in a way, is that order and disorder feed off each other and there's a mutual dependence going on. Yeah. And Dimitri, let's just see if, again, as, a, as an amateur and a, and a not scientist, see if I've sort of got my head around this. Planetary systems can maintain, a, maintain order by harnessing entropy. Is that correct? Yes, in some sense, yes. I mean, we have evidence of that. I mean, as you know, the, the, the sort of our understanding of planets and in fact exoplanets has taken off in recent years with uh, the detection of the first exoplanet in the 1990s uh, and, and 1990s. And from there on, the field has just sort of exploded. Um, so going back to, to your question, I, I think it's probably right. Um, and again, there is, I would refer back to what I said in the beginning about the symmetries and the conditions under which we observe something happening. Um, and yes, we know from observations that systems which are sort of um, more distant from their parent star, right, in the uh, exoplanetary uh, system, um, sort of the Trappist systems or the Kepler systems that have a series of, of planets surrounding the star, that there is the ones that are further away from the star, they manage to actually stay in orbit, although you would naturally uh, expect them to be all over the place, to go into a chaotic, but probably because they fall back and they pick up sort of resonances mm -hmm. in their trajectories. So yes, in some sense, you, you sort of see in nature these examples of um, order harnessing disorder or entropy, um, and actually uh, yeah, maintaining in the process symmetry or some harmony uh, okay. in their, uh, in, in this particular case of the uh, planets, of the exoplanets, uh, maintaining their orbits. There's a lot going on in the dynamics there, but yes, I think although one would expect such a system to be chaotic, you know, they're not. The other piece of evidence that we have uh, of such a thing happening, I think, is in our own solar system with the asteroid belt, where in principle, um, there are gaps in the belt and we don't find any asteroid. And that's because in those particular places, the sort of resonances between Jupiter, uh, which actually holds all of these things together, um, are such that, you know, pushes these asteroids, these rocks away. And there are other uh, places where actually you will find like the Hilda family, where you will actually find uh, a group of asteroids uh, clustering there. So in chaos, then maybe you can find this sort of um, resonances, you can find these symmetries. And I think it is a, a, a result of the fact that yes, you harness entropy disorder and you maintain entropy in, in, and you maintain symmetry in the form of these resonances, which allow the planets to, or the exoplanets to stay in orbit. Okay. Ian, this is something, this is an idea which you've explored the, the correspondence of opposites in some detail mm -hmm. in, your, in the matter with things. And we'll come on to that in just a moment. I, it's, but it's, it's an idea which is obviously central to genetics, to physics and mm. neuroscience we're gonna hear about in just a moment. But I would suggest that it, it sort of reaches, this idea of the correspondence of opposites reaches everywhere. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it sort of it extends to, to all things. I mean, Goethe said that music is liquid architecture and, and architecture's frozen music, both are characterized by a correspondence of order and disorder. So without inharmonious dissonant intervals, uh, for example, music would be just one monotonous consonance after another. Uh, and, and, you know, William Blake, without contraries, there is no progression. Um, and if there weren't a very slight imbalance in the amount of matter and antimatter in the universe, then, then you know, physicist friends tell me that nothing would exist nothing at would exist. all. So, Ian, what is your sort of take on this idea of the coincidence of opposites as it relates to neuroscience? 
and the, the structure of the brain, should we say? Well, uh, so too, vast, the, too vast a subject. Uh, uh, well, it's a big subject. Yeah. I, I think the, co the coincidence of opposites is something that, you, as you quite rightly say, is threaded through everything that exists, and it's a principle that we ought to respect more than we do. Um, it's what Jung called in antiadromia, that things literally means go two different ways, but often by pursuing a path in one direction, you end up finding yourself in the place you were trying to run away from. The neuroscience is, is more about the asymmetrical nature of the brain and its relationship to the world around it. It's rather odd, isn't it, that the world that surrounds us does so equally on both sides. But the, the brain is not symmetrical. First of all, it's divided, which is a bit of a puzzle. But the two halves, which you might expect to be symmetrical, are absolutely not. They're not the same size, weight, shape. Um, they have different uh, cytoarchitecture in different places. They use different ratios of gray to white matter. They use different balances of um, uh, neurotransmitters. And so there really is nothing about them that is symmetrical. And it's out of that that we are able to do so much more than we would. If they were symmetrical, we would have killed an opportunity to have two different centers that each can on its own sustain consciousness and brings into being for us a world with different characteristics. And it, there you see your tension between the opposites that coincide, that it is important that we both were able to hold together the vision of the left hemisphere or the, the world that comes to attention, given the nature of the left hemisphere's attention applied to the world, bring that together with the qualities of the right hemisphere's world. And they're quite different. In one, things are punctate, and another, they are not atomistic but fluidly connected. In one, they're static. In the other, they are constantly moving and flowing. Mm -hmm. In one, they're uh, disembodied. In the other, they're not, and so forth. So creativity depends on, once again, being able to have opposite forces working together to bring something that you know is best summed up as at the at the edge of chaos, where order and disorder meet. Yes. I, but I, I wondered if you you had any reflections yourself on this matter of entropy, because it seems to me there are two very important elements in physics that are absolutely not symmetrical. One is entropy, which relentlessly goes in one direction. Mm. And the other is the arrow of time. And I know there are physicists who believe it could be reversed, but I, I think the balance is that it, I defer to Dimitri here, but certainly Lee Smolin, who I respect very highly, believes that time is irreversible and that actually nothing in physics would make any sense, nothing in biology would make any sense if time were reversible. There couldn't be a universe, there couldn't be experience, there couldn't be any of these things. So <clears throat> once again there, there are a couple of things that don't neatly obey symmetry, and I, I'm not trying to be awkward about this, but... Yeah. But it's, it is slightly different from the dipole thing. The dipole thing is brilliant. I, I, I agree. That is the, the way in which most things in the universe seem to be structured. But this element of symmetry suggests the sameness and a stasis where the asymmetry produces constant recombination of things that are changing and flowing. And one, one way of thinking about a, a shape here that might help is that a circle is certainly symmetrical, however you look at it, but nothing changes in a circle. It, it's, there it is, that's its given. But if you bring a third dimension in and you have it circling, but gradually shifting onwards, you get a spiral. Mm -hmm. And the spiral combines a kind of symmetry when looked at one, looked down one way and asymmetry another way, which is all important to its ability to produce novelty, creativity, and so forth. I, th I think that the, the word symmetry doesn't really work in terms of describing this idea of the coincidence of opposites. You, you mentioned Jung, um, who, who yes. said, you know, psychology basically depends upon balanced opposites. Yes. And for him, it was thinking and feeling, sensation, intuition, introvert, extrovert, and so on. What he was talking about, he would probably refer to more in terms of polarity, which again is, a, yes. is not an ideal word. But this idea, uh, so I take your point, the word symmetry doesn't actually express adequately this concept, which is really the idea of the coincidence of opposites. But it's an idea which people have been juggling with for centuries. Mm. We recently had an event at the British Museum, which uh, Dimitra and, and Dennis took a part in, 
and we looked at this idea as it finds expression in the British Museum's collection and with the 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 Taijitu, the yin and yang symbol yes, for example yes. mm. now that is a wonderful expression of this concept but it's not really symmetry it's it to do with it's to do with symmetry and asymmetry forming a symmetry or an asymmetry there's 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 a paradox well, the there's an asymmetry of symmetry with asymmetry and that is a yeah. very important observation I'm, I'm sorry i wasn't able to come to the the, the british um, museum event but the in my book i show the difference between an architectural facade and a copy of it mm. the original facade is a palladian facade of the villa known as la rotonda and it's uh, been a template for many architects and so that's 16th century and then you've got um, Jefferson's, I think it's the library at Charlottesville, um, where he copied this, but it's absolutely symmetrical. And it seems to me that when you look at the two, the, the facade of, of, um, of La Rotonda has life in it because there are, it has a basic symmetry, but there are all these little tiny asymmetries that make it move and live. Whereas the, the facade of the library, coming much later, 300 years later, after the Age of Reason, has this absolute symmetry, which seems lifeless to me. Mm. It's okay. beautiful in a way, yeah. but, but not as beautiful as the one that has sure. asymmetry. Asymmetry seems to be part of beauty as well. Uh, absolutely, and that's a whole separate discussion, but, it's, yes, the, yes. but too much symmetry is dull and repetitive in architecture and whatever. We, yes. need, we need that asymmetry mixed in there. So this living on the edge between order and disorder, um, it seems to me it's the most fundamental symmetry or polarity uh, that there is in the universe. It must have been the first symmetry to have been broken, yes. uh, it, you know, to get from a fairly uniform beginning to the huge range of structures that exist in the universe today. And funnily enough, you know, here we are scientists waking, in, sorry, this generation waking up to this idea as something which, I mean, Dennis, you've been working on this for many years now, the harnessing of stochasticity. Uh, Ian, you've been working for 20 years or so, I think, exploring this idea with the coincidence of opposites. And it's interesting that finally this generation is waking up to an idea which was absolutely central to ancient mythologies mm -hmm. and uh, ancient traditions. I saw on Channel the Gilchrist, your fantastic channel, Ian, you were talking about the, the story of Shevrat Hakelium. I'm not sure oh, if I yeah. pronounced that right, yes, in the Kabbalah, yes. Uh, Kabbalah. Yes. Could you just tell us briefly about that idea of the, the original breaking of... of Yes, it was something I came across only a few years ago. Um, I, I started to read the Kabbalah, the, the, the body of um, religious texts, mystical religious texts of Judaism. And what is interesting to me is that there is a kind of resonance which is asymmetrical between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere and the coming into being of something. If I explain that, I'll then talk about the, 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 um, the idea in the Kabbalah. That is that we know from a lot of very good research um, that the initial assessment of anything that is unknown seems to engage the right hemisphere. And when it's seen as something familiar, the left hemisphere takes it over and takes it apart and categorizes it. And then whatever that is, is then taken back into the right hemisphere and reintegrated. That structure is from right to left to right. It's not just back and forwards. Mm -hmm. In the Kabbalah, there's a story of creation. And in the beginning, there was a being whose name means either nothing or the being. <laughs> and how did this being called Ein Zof create? Not by stretching out a hand and making something happen, but by first of all withdrawing, because without withdrawing, there was no place for anything other than Ein Zof to exist. And in that space, there were arranged, I think, 12 vessels, and a single spark came out of Ein Zof and fell on the vessels and shattered them. Because they, going back to my idea about how the hemispheres work, the space was created, the receptive, actively receptive space of the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere has its categories, but whatever it was is too big for the categories, so those are broken down. And there is a third phase, which is tikkun, repair, which is an act in which humanity plays an important role, re recreating these vessels more beautiful than they were before they were shattered. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of the thing in Japanese ceramics called kintsugi, in which you repair a broken vase using gold. And the end of this is something more beautiful than before it was broken. Mm. Okay. So, Dimitra, we've seen that um, randomness and disorder play a central role in the design of the universe. But how far 
does uh, the, this polarity or symmetry um, reach? Is it quite limited in its applications, do you think, or, or is it something which uh, might perhaps apply to all processes from the subatomic all the way through to the large scale universe? Uh, yes, I think, um, I mean, symmetry, you can definitely say that the, the sort of the more prominent examples have come of the, from the subatomic world, actually. Mm. Having said that, we now know that a lot of the more recent discoveries uh, have been made because symmetry was broken in some sense. So all the more recent particles uh, discoveries, the bosons and so on, are there and we found them because symmetry broke basically. So, um, so this is in the sort of one end of the scale, the, the microcosm. If we go on the other end of the scale in the universe, um, I hear this time and again that, uh, you know, how can you make sense of, of the universe and it's, you know, ever expanding and so on. But I think as far as we, we look back, as I said earlier, at the moment of creation and, you know, from there on, um, there was this, this unique moment, this unique point where sort of call it Big Bang or whatever you want to call it. And from there on, structures evolved in a kind of symmetric way. And I will go back, I think the more I think about it, the, uh, I, I think I, I would go back and use your terminology is that um, the universe harnesses probably, harnessed and still does on this idea of, uh, of disorder to create order. I mean, we do live in an ordered universe. We're not, mm. you know, things don't just, happen and you know the galaxies recede from each other the universe expands in a sort of an ordered way it doesn't sort of happen randomly or i wouldn't use the i, I guess the term random is probably not a, a, a an appropriate one um but it does happen in an ordered way so but it is i guess this combination of the arrow of time that ian just mentioned entropy, which is always increasing, that allows this, that allows us to, that allows the universe to be what it is, and us to be here at this very moment, living organisms and observing the universe around us. So I, I don't agree that the universe is asymmetric. I think the universe is uh, symmetric and it is because of the underlying entropy, principle of entropy, and the hour of time that, you know, things are the way we observe them to be. Mm. Uh, so I think this is okay. probably... Dennis. Yes, I... I